Yeah, dear, dear guests, welcome to the Adorno Lectures 2022. I'm happy to have the opportunity to introduce to you these lectures and Linda Alter, our presenter this year. And I'm happy that you have come here in such a big number. I would have expected that uh, in post or pre-post Corona times. <laughs> dear Linda and dear Eva Gilma, um, representative of Lucan Publishers, critical theory and post-colonial theory are not at ease with each other. Deeply, if ambivalently, rooted in European historical experiences, repressive as well as emancipatory, and in the European tradition of social thought, critical theory has for the longest time not been really interested in, or systematically open to post-colonial, or if you like, southern experiences and epistemologies. Instead of continuing the widespread and somehow incorporated ignorance of post- and decolonial approaches, concerns and insights in critical theory, or of even widening the gap. One of the main ambitions of critical theory as practice at the Institut für Sozialforschung will be in the years to come to open the critical theoretical mindset for a decidedly global, globalized way of thinking. Understanding postcolonial theory, or rather theories, as Inagana has suggested, as global critical theories is arguably a key to a certain renewed the emancipatory agenda of critical theory writ large in present times. It is the contradictions not of capitalism, democracy or the state that should be at the core of critical theorizing in the 2020s, but the contradictions of capitalism, democracy, the state, and to be sure, of class, identity, subjectivity, and so on, in a truly globalized world. Any emancipatory and transformative agenda, be it theoretical or practical, or appropriately enough, both, has to convincingly transcend methodological nationalism, epistemic Europeanism, and habitual colonialism. Provincializing critical theory, decolonizing a tradition of thought that, to quote Gurminda Bambra, has never explicitly, and I would add, never convincingly and convincingly acknowledged colonial histories, is the order of the day, or rather of the decade. Only by understanding, reflecting, and disentangling the colonial modern, or what Aníbal Quijano and other writers address as modernidad colonialidad, or colonialidad del poder, will critical theory come to terms with what is going on and going wrong at any place of the world we might look at and be interested in. The analytical lens, the conceptual apparatus, the categories of critique and the normative positionings of critical theory need to be checked, adapted, revised and or transformed if we want to continue claiming that we are in this academically, politically, personally, because we want to add our share to minimize suffering, to raise consciousness, and to promote justice, not least epistemic justice, in the world we live in. As Bandra writes, Marx and Engels were historically confident that there would be and come the moment, quote, when the bourgeoisie understands its own self-interest as a limit to human interest. The question today is when the so-called Western civilization will finally reach this very point of fundamental critical self-reflection, acknowledging not only that we are doing less than what is humanly possible, but that we constantly and actively afflict inhumanity among others from the hunger crisis in East Africa, to the border fence climbers in Melilla, or just yesterday, 
the 46 Mexican migrants found dead in a truck in San Antonio, Texas. Self-interest or human interest? We should not be surprised, to quote again Gurvinder Bhakra, if the overcoming of colonial advantage now poses a similar question as the one raised by Marx and Engels back in 1848. We should not be surprised, but be prepared, at least intellectually. To begin with the pending dialogue of critical theory and post-colonial thinking on part of the Institut für Sozialforschung, back in the spring of 2021, we decided to invite Linda Martin Elkov to give the 2022 Adorno Lecture. Linda Elkov is a professor of philosophy at the Hunter College and the Reddit Center, City University of New York. She has authored or edited more than a dozen books, among them in 2006, Visible Identities, Race, Gender and Self, Oxford University Press, for which she received the Franz Fanon Award of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. In 2015 and 2018, respectively, she published both with Polity Press, The Future of Whiteness, and Rape and Resistance, Understanding the Complexities of Sexual Violation. She's also the editor, together with Lalo Anderson and Paul Taylor, of the Rutledge Companion to the Philosophy of Race. The guiding idea of her contribution to this year's Adorno Lectures is to de-psychologize and de-individualize racism, linking racial identities instead to particular histories and cultures with a special focus on historically and socially situated practices of everyday life. In this context, the colonial histories of modern societies are of central importance for understanding the historical formations of race, cultural racism, and the crisis of white identity. Race, culture, history is the conceptual triad Linda Martin Alcov will be offering and confronting us with in the three lectures that are now awaiting us. But before giving the floor to Professor Alcov, let me at least shortly address what as you all should and most probably will know, has been happening in the last three or four days on the occasion of the three evenings to come. There has been published and circulated last Sunday an open letter incriminating Linda Alt for publica publicly aligning with the boycotts, divestment and sanctions or BDS campaign. This letter also charges the Institute for Sozialforschung of giving room and audience to anti-Semitic positions, thus breaking with the Institute's long-standing constitutive tradition of unequivocal resistance to anti-Semitism in all of its guises and forms. I want to make perfectly and unmistakably clear here tonight that this is not the case. The IFS condemns anti-Semitic positions of any sort defends Israel's right to exist and categorically rejects any attempts or activities to boycott Israel. We have decided not to cancel this year's Adorno lectures on short notice because we're convinced that scientific discourse has to be safeguarded, well knowing that we're moving and maneuvering on thin ice. Let me, however, assure you that the eventuality giving title to the open letter and pictured by its authors almost as a certainty, a boycott of Israel in the name of Adorno in Frankfurt and under the auspices of the IFS, so far has never happened, won't happen now, and will not happen in the future. Linda Alpov, welcome to the Adorno Lectures 2022. We are looking forward to your first talk tonight, which in the light of the disconcerting experiences we have been making these last days, unfortunately will not be followed by a public discussion. A circumstance I want to announce and to apologize for in advance. Apologies go to Linda first 
and to the interested audience. The IFS will give, however, room to a public debate on the entanglements of post-colonial thought and the current wave of, of anti-Semitism in the near future. Linda, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this invitation. This is a big honor for me. Um, the Frankfurt School influenced me profoundly from the beginning of my philosophical studies and my approach to critical philosophy of race is very much a critical theory approach as I think you'll see tonight. Um, let me get my water. What I hope to convince you of over the next three evenings is that we need the category of race to understand the present moment. We need to understand that race does not only mean biology, that there are different possible meanings of the concept. We need to complicate the way we understand race in order to understand the current forms of anti-racist <coughs> resistance, such as, most importantly, in the United States, the movement called Black Lives Matter, which uses the term black intentionally, not African American, not an ethnic term, but a broad category. Um, so tomorrow, I'm going to be focusing on racism and particularly cultural racism, arguing that we need to shift our attention from the individual-based attitudinal racism, which is so much under discussion, to um, look again at the concept of cultural racism um, today. And Friday, I'm going to argue and hope hopefully convince you that we need to talk about white nationalism and we need to talk about the replacement theory. The crisis of white identity, um, which is global, it's certainly in the Americas and in Europe, is largely a crisis of historical narrative. And tonight, um, I'm going to try to convince you <laughs> of a, a concept of race I'm calling the historical formation of race. As Stuart Hall argued, the concept of race operated mainly as a silent partner in mid-20th century United Kingdom. And this silence even extended to its colonies, such as his home in Jamaica. The very word black, he writes, was, quote, taboo, unsayable. It betrayed the prevailing prejudices too openly race depended on a more euphemistic, coded discourse, unquote, he, he says. And I, so I would want to suggest that this sort of linguistic strategy, a strategy that enables racism by disabling race talk, has operated in similar ways through many parts of the world, even in Latin America, where I am from, in which affectionate diminutives such as Cholita, Negrito, paper over racial hierarchies. The project of the critical philosophy of race has been to try to bring race into the sphere of the sayable. But this time, without the reification that obscures <clears throat> its historically dynamic, inherently social and contextually variable character, as well as its nefarious ideological uses. So when I use the term race tonight, I'm going to mean very simply a group identity that has visible markers on the body. Um, so on that minimalist concept, there's no commitment to biological claims or to predictions of, of behavior. 
The idea that races and racial identities are socially constructed has been the main way to undo the taboo around race talk as a way to address the fear that talking about the significance and the reality of race will solidify race once again. <clears throat> Social constructivist theories of race aim to unseat biological essentialist theories. As Chike Jeffers explains, social constructionist theorists have argued that it is only through social and historical processes that the particular physical, biological, and geographical differences that we recognize as racial have come to gain some stable significance. Since the 1990s, new versions of biological realism about race have <clears throat> tried to separate the plausible ways in which diverse ancestries and morphologies can be grouped from the implausible claim that behavioral, moral, and intellectual attributes accompany these group identities. So the new realists, Michael Hardiman, Quayshawn Spencer, Phil Kitcher, um, Andrea Sun, there's a number of them, they're strict minimalists, and they reject the idea that race concepts have any explanatory value or can help us with normative concerns. So as Hardiman states, the new realism that he advocates for is definitely in line with deflating the significance of race. But my concern in this paper is going to be with the broad category of social construction. Social constructionists do more to engage with the normative questions of race talk, and sometimes they offer normative proposals. Sally Haslinger, for example, renders a view of social construction in which the social political reality of race uses the concept for purposes of domination. And she says it's also based on false beliefs and it should be eliminated. Racial differentiation, on her view, emerged as a way to produce political differentiation and the establishment of hierarchies that feed a system of racist ideology and systemic oppression. In recent work, Sally Heslinger has modified her view to accept that collective racial identities can be used positively by oppressed groups for survival and social navigation. But she continues to hold that ideas of race are in the long run pernicious. And there's a lot more to be said about the nuances of, of Sally's view. But this paper will argue that the social construction approach to race as, is, as it is usually formulated is misleading about the nature of racial identities and the solutions to racism. And rather than continue to understand race as a social construction, we should shift to the language of historical formation. I will argue here that racial identities are best understood as formed through historical events, events that include interpolation by emerging racial categories as Hesslinger and other social constructionists argue, but much more than this. The historical formation of race is a dyna dynamic and ongoing process that is obscured by disavowals of racial categories as conceptually mistaken or as non-referential or as inevitably morally pernicious. In this sense, races are formed not simply as ideas, or ideologies and policies that create constraints and enablements, but as forms of life with associated patterns of subjectivity, including as a wealth of social psychology is shown, presumptive attitudes and behavioral dispositions. As historical formations, racial identities are thoroughly social, as well as contextual, variegated internally, and undergoing constant change. And so the substance of racial identities, I think, is best understood as local, as Stuart Hall, Silvio torres Sayant, and others have argued. The view that races and racial identities are historical formations 
enhances our understanding of their contextualism and their dynamism, but it also points us toward better accounts of the main source of dynamism, which is in the always contested patterns of social and material life at every level. In this way, the view that races are historical formations focuses the debate about how to make progress in reducing racism on, on the historical processes that are ongoing that formed our racial identities in particular ways with particular associated content and that continue to perpetuate racism. So at the end of this talk tonight, I will use whiteness as my main example of this. Following the work of, of Michael Omi and Howard Wynant, two sociologists among others, I'll argue that the historical processes that formed racial groups include not only state-sanctioned exclusions, differential treatment, and the distribution of protections and privileges, but also movements of resistance and creative forms of community building and collective expression among the stigmatized. Activists have constantly challenged and altered identity terms. In the United States, uh, in my lifetime, we've moved from the term Negro, which was used when I was little, Afro-American, African-American, Black. Um, for Latinos, we moved from the term Spanish, which I was called when I was a little girl. <laughs> We moved from Span. everybody was Spanish. Doesn't matter whether you're from Spain or not. Um, Spanish and then Hispanic and Latino, and now we have the term Latinx. So they've also redefined existing terms uh, and changed the criteria of inclusion and the subsequent boundaries. Social constructionism can focus so much on the establishment of official hierarchies that the collective and individual agency of the racially oppressed gets overlooked in our understanding of the historical formation of racial identities. To change the future of race and racial identities, I think we have to start working from the bottom up to change the direction of history. So let me begin with this first section on the general approach. Uh, I'll talk a little bit generally about uh, identity categories. So let's consider the attention that's really only very recently been paid to group identities such as race, but also gender, sexuality, ethnicity, dis disability, and so on. The political questions that are posed by activists about identity terms today are not entirely dissimilar from traditional metaphysical debates over identity in the tradition of European philosophy since the Greeks debated the question of the one and the many. These latter debates centered on the problems that beset any account of identity, whether it concerns cats, apples, or humans. Plurality, internal differences, and change. Are the grounds of unity natural or only nominal? Has the unity of some categories been coercive? Activists and social movements push back against coercive processes of categorization but generally develop revised terms, expanded options, and reconceptualizations that can be quite radical revisions, rather than advocating for elimination, given the ongoing social significance of social identities in most current societies. Grouping materially instantiated individual entities or beings into categories always entails a downplaying of differences. Nonetheless, the use of categories is vital to function in complex environments. With the helpful shorthand of group terms and typologies, we can guess that any cat we see may enjoy milk, that any apple is safe to eat. The fact that such generalizations do not apply perfectly across every individual cat or apple does not make them worthless, and normal category use is usually cognizant that there are exceptions. In the case of our social categories of identity for human beings, rather than cats and apples, what might seem to be purely metaphysical questions about how justifiable it is to corral distinct individuals into a single category will 
quickly embroil us in questions of politics and social systems, as well as individual agency and free will. Category use in general is justified by utility, but we need to ask what is the utility served by categorizing human beings into identity groups? And for whom are identity terms useful? Or better, what are the different possible functions in various contexts? <coughs> to further complicate the picture, Stuart Hall has argued that the struggle over the relations of representation has necessarily led to a struggle over the politics of representation itself. He says, since how things are represented and the machineries and regimes of representation in a culture play a constitutive and not merely a reflexive after the event role, unquote. So like Foucault, Hall is arguing here that the descriptive content of socially recognized identities have a hand in producing those identities in the sense of producing persons with forms of subjecthood that are affected by and conforming to the dominant ideas about their groups. So this adds a further layer of complexity to the problem of identity when it concerns not cats and apples, but human beings. In defining identities, we're not merely choosing which group differences to highlight, but possibly in some cases we are choosing which group differences to encourage or even mandate. So what we can see thus far is that first, identity concepts aggregate through setting aside inevitable differences, and second, that such aggregate concepts get uptake in general populations because of their functional role either to majorities or to minorities, elites or non-elites, or both. And three, following Hall, that the characteristics used to justify group concepts may have an effect on human behavior or the formation of subjectivity. The question of whether any given category of identity is useful or defensible will involve a number of considerations, including its genealogy or formation, its social effects, and who has had a hand in the process of forming the ideas and practices that make up a given identity. Social identities such as race make descriptive claims with normative implications, and both elements require critical analysis. As Georgia Warnke argues, simply saying that one takes identities to be socially constructed is insufficient as a normative analysis. It cannot tell us how to discriminate between good and bad identities, she says. All identities, she continues, are bound up with power and thus all require critical and normative reflection. Much of the significance of racial identities in particular appears to be negative. Being racialized as non-white endangers people's lives and livelihoods. It's for this reason that many believe social identities are inherently vulnerable to systems of ranking that endanger democracy, cooperation, and peace. Surely, as Warnke and Appiah and others argue, their social significance should be diminished or curtailed. Yet, identities are also the manifestation of our connections to history, to communities, to families, and to groups with which we share commonalities. As Bernard Williams put it, in regard to socially recognized identities, he says, quote, something is given, though I must choose to take it up, unquote. Indeed, Williams argues that it is the givenness of identity, the way its meaning exceeds my will, that helps us to see why the politics of identity should be so essential to our life now. Our identities are not something we can readily ignore or easily disavow or overcome through individual acts. Thus, to say that social identities are a mix of the natural and the nominal, or the physiological and the historical, is to say that they are a mix of the given and the way in which we individually and collectively take up the given, as Williams puts it. 
Identities such as gender and sexuality may develop from real features we have, such as wombs, but these features are always subject to variable interpretations. Thus, the argument that identity categories are nothing but strategies of domination ignore the descriptive aspect, as Michael Hardiman argues, but also the effects of resistance on the meanings of the given. So in this slide, I want to advance in this next section four general features of racial identity shared with other social identities. The variable way an identity category may be defined in different contexts, the rootedness of identities in social life, the subsequently limited agency of individuals in regard to their identities, and the ways in which social categories of identity can be redefined by resistance movements so that identities can be altered, not simply by nefarious elites. I'll say something about some of these. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But I can tell you where I talk about it more in my work. <laughs> Our familiar social categories of identity are very much rooted in social life and institutions. Contextual variability does not always translate into in effective individual control. It simply multiplies the context an individual may have to engage with in regard to their identity. And I, I really think we have to start thinking about this as a massive material system. When we look at the social world around us and we observe who is rich and who is poor, who does service work, manufacturing, construction, or technology design, we are looking at the material effects of historical events and structural policies. The categories of socially recognized identities continue to yield reliable predictions of income home ownership, likely imprisonment, and the sector of the labor market in which one works. The maintenance of this material organization of social groups is the result of conscious and collective social efforts. So we need to understand the limited control individuals have to, and that to change aspects of my identity, I need to engage with existing systems of meaning that interpret and interpolate me. As an individual, I may be able to engage with the racial and gendered organization of the economy in a way that avoids identity-based disadvantages. For example, I might try to get into a higher paid profession that is dominated by group identities <coughs> different than my own. But I can't simply declare the social world to be irrelevant. To succeed in a sector of the economy in which my group is marginalized, I may need to assimilate to new practices of dress, speech, comportment, even beliefs. This does not mean I can't challenge and change the current conventions, but to ignore the realm of socially understood meanings is to invite failure and also to risk becoming unintelligible which diminishes my effectiveness toward changing social systems of meaning around identities. In general, the meanings and boundaries and types of social identities change because of the collective practice, some in the form of progressive social movements and some that take less positive forms, as I'll discuss later. Collective practices can force policy changes and produce new cultural forms of expression, unlike individual declarations of being a race traitor. Social movements not only change the meanings of identities, but can also create or bring into larger public awareness entirely new categories of identity, such as Chicano and trans. Identities are, of course, in many cases, the product of calculated and concerted efforts by state actors. Constitutions and other forms of legislation can inscribe differential rights, including suffrage, citizenship, and migration, and courts interpret the law's applicability to specific individuals in a way that it establishes the borders between identity groups and the criteria that will be used to determine inclusion. Notoriously, the Canadian and U.S. governments have operated unilaterally to establish the criteria of indigenous or Indian identity. 
often contradicting the ideas and practices of Native American groups themselves. States interpret identity claims based on values they want to uphold, such as property rights and the inviolability of commercial transactions. Narrowly defined rules about indigenous identity that require documentation and evidence that the state will recognize has the effect of circumscribing land claims, as does denying recognition of mixed peoples. What we have in the United States is, is a, a law that you have to be 25% native to count as native. And that's a law that has no <laughs> necessary relationship to indigenous groups themselves and their understanding of identities, which is often quite, quite different. So ident uh, indigenous groups have flouted state laws and boundaries. Some, like the Iroquois in New York, have created their own passports for international travel, and they garnered recognition from the United Nations for their own forms of identity documents. It's important to recognize that resistance does not simply take the form of an attempt to escape identities altogether. Oppressed groups can be forcibly segregated, but they may also prefer to live in neighborhoods where they are the majority, and where, as Tommy Shelby points out, they may then be able to rely on quote, their established social networks for childcare, transportation, and employment information, unquote, as well as a reduced likelihood of daily microaggressions. Community segregation may be enforced, but it can also be voluntary. And in both cases, segregation, of course, has an effect on family formation and cultural forms of expression with a resultant impact on identities. So it's important not to overlook the agency of non-elites. Shelby's analysis of what he calls ghetto poverty diagnoses a persistent bias among social analysts who tend to downgrade the agency of the poor to see, quote, dysfunction where perhaps lies resistance to injustice, he says. In reality, the conscious collective action of non-elites as well as the aggregation of individual choices can shift both the meanings and political effects of social categories of identity across time. As Alison Weir puts it, quote, identities are not simply effects of a single binary logic of subjection through exclusion, but are produced through multiple contesting relations. She goes on to argue that, quote, no identities are produced only through subjugating regimes of power, and that theorists need to attend to the various we relations in which one enacts agency, unquote. So this, she, she's not downplaying the long durée of colonialism, but reminding us, I think, of the successes of everyday acts of resistance, of struggles to maintain a positive sense of self, and the sometimes unintended consequences of elite projects that can enable new forms of agency, create new solidarities, and motivate political participation toward new ends. Weir has been among the many feminist philosophers arguing for relational accounts of the self that may give us some normative guidance on the ethical questions posed by identity. As Weir puts it, Identities are, quote, connections to our ideals, to each other, to places, to our bodies, to ourselves, unquote. Our relations with others can be stifling, but they are also the means by which we can achieve productive forms of self-understanding, deliberate over goals, resist conventional ideas, and in these ways maximize our individual autonomy. Identities thus represent the givenness of our material and historical context, but they can also enable knowledge and action. Put in this way, we might rethink how we understand the complicating intersections of identity terms. My connections to and relations with others are grounded in the material particularities of shared locations and shared experiences, as well as the interdependence of families, co-workers, and affective networks of care, and not simply on the stipulative 
identity categories of the state. This suggests that the central relations that affect my own self-formation will never simply involve those who share a straightforward form of identity with me. I may share a location with a neighborhood of very diverse people or share experiences with a diverse group of people who have a similar form of disability or history of migration. So my types of people are part of my identity. To deepen this analysis, I want to turn next to look more specifically at the question of race in relationship to the self and to raise doubts about the adequacy of the language of social construction to represent this relationship. As Charles W. Mills put it, the assignment of racial identity, quote, influences the socialization one receives, the life world in which one moves, the experiences one has, the worldview one develops, in short, one's being and consciousness, whether we acknowledge this or not. And therefore, eliminativism may be a form of illusion or bad faith that disables self-reflection. And for a phenomenologist such as Sartre, at least in his later works, the self is the product of a dialectical interaction between the particulars of one's social situation and the choices one makes as an individual. As Donna Dale Mark Marcano explains, Sartre's model, quote, en enables us to explain how and why members of an oppressed group positively assume and create an identity for ourselves that include categories that have been detrimental. In order to acknowledge this history, as well as the group ties and forms of resistance that have had a, sh a hand in shaping our identities. So the desirability of forgetting this history may vary across groups. <laughs> Since there are some who would be happy to forget atrocities that played a role in their family enrichment, others who wish to forget the traumatic humiliations of group mistreatment, while others wish the world to remember the lessons of the past as well as the history of their group's resistance and survival. Clearly, forgetting is not a valid philosophical option, whatever its motivations. If ourselves are indeed the product of dialectical engagement, a philosophical treatment of identity and the self will need to incorporate the situated and relational elements that play a role in constituting us. Social constructionists about race are not uniformly committed to eliminativism. But while historians and other social scientists have, in the last couple decades, been producing these really rich ethnographies that reveal the multi-layered processes of social construction, too many philosophers have focused only on elite agents downplaying, as Shelby puts it, the agency of the oppressed. The history of race reveals its fundamentally social origin and many nefarious uses, but not the reach of its potential transformability. Further, although race is an important element in our histories, this does not mean that there are no similarities across racial groups, no significant differences within groups, or that race meanings will remain stable. Yet still, as Mills emphasizes, race has such a significant impact on our lives, it cannot but affect what we know, how we know, and how we understand ourselves in relation to our worlds. W.A.B. Du Bois took a Hegelian approach that understood African peoples in the post-slavery diaspora as engaged in a dialectic process of self-formation in light of their racialized treatment. Slaves had been violently dispossessed of their languages, ethnic cultures, and religions as a means of domination and control. Yet, rather than simply assimilating to the Anglo-European culture of North America, black people, even under slavery, were creatively producing new forms of cultural expression and communal forms of life that gave voice to the sensibilities of their unique and shared historical experience as well as their group aspirations. Abstract individual conceptions of selfhood could be, um, could be helpful in withstanding racist projections 
but did not shed much light on the group-related experiences Du Bois described or the specific forms of cultural life and artistic expression that emerged from slavery. Historical forces had shaped the conditions in which blackness became a feature of the self, albeit a dynamic and variable one. Similarly, in the southern part of the Western Hemisphere, theorists such as Jose Vasconcelos and Jose Carlos Mariategui were articulating specifically racialized forms of social identity with political implications. For Vasconcelos, racial identities are the product of both biological and social forces, but racial rankings are simply tools of imperialistic policy, he says. Vasconcelos was concerned to defend racial mixing or mestizaje, which was you know, widespread in Latin America and also the target of criticism by some European intellectuals who justified their own superior ranking on the basis of claims to purity and unified cultural essences. But for Vasconcelos, such claims ignore the fact that all races are in a constant process of dynamic change and mutual influence. Diversification improves humanity and will lead, he believed, to the formation of a more unified race, a cosmic race that would be stronger than any pure race. Yet, while advocating for mestizaje, Vasconcelos reproduced a new form of racial ranking in which one of the benefits of the cosmic race would be the diminution of the pure racial types of black and indigenous people. In contrast, Mariategui criticized the way in which mestizo and criollo elites defined the problem of the Indian, as it was called, as a problem of resistance to assimilation. As a forerunner of societies such as Ecuador and Colombia that today define themselves as plurinational, Mariategui argued that political systems needed to recognize the legitimacy of Indian identities and claims. He was writing in the 1920s. Indigenous groups in Peru had distinct ideas and practices about how to communally navigate land stewardship, how to practice religion, how to express aesthetic values, and these um, practices produced flourishing communities prior to the conquest. So he said <coughs> Indians simply need land, not projects of assimilation. But this claim was predicated on an acceptance of their self-understanding of their identity as distinct from the Peruvian national identity. The contrast between political philosophy coming from Latin America versus European traditions is instructive here. The project of Latin American political philosophers such as Jose Martí, Simón Bolívar, and Mariátegui was never to create ideal political institutions for any given collection of random individuals, but to create workable institutions that could overcome the devastations wrought by colonialism, land annexation, cultural imperialism, language oppression, racism, and slavery. So this required addressing group differences and group histories. For Mariategui, the Indians of Peru deserved land rights not as individuals, but as specific historical peoples whose land had been stolen. The political philosophy of a nation such as Peru could not then follow classical liberal theoretical traditions that treated individual citizens as essentially fungible with uniform rights and duties. This is what fueled Barti's concern that the Eurocentric universities of Latin America offered, as he said, quote, no analysis of elements peculiar to the peoples of America, end quote. As a result of their Eurocentric and US-centric curriculum, he says, quote, the young go out into the world wearing Yankee or French spectacles, hoping to govern a people they do not know, unquote. In the new American nations, good government could only come about when thought begins to be American, he said. Marti despised the concept of race, held that racism was a sin against humanity, and sought to undo the racist projections the Spaniards made on black people and Indians. 
but he also held that new societies must come to understand and address each group that founds the new nations as having distinct histories with new condensations of what he called vital and individual characteristics of thought and habit. Writing some decades later, the philosopher Leopoldo Zea echoed Marti's, writing, Marti's warning in his diagnosis of the sad state of Latin American philosophy curriculum that had largely adopted European frameworks without investigating their own cultural context. Zea said, the Latin American man who had lived so comfortably found that the ideas in which he believed had become useless artifacts without sense. So in Zaya's view, philosophy that seeks to escape addressing specificity will lose its relevance and utility. So what becomes clear from the political history of ideas about race is that there have been many different purposes in its usage, from political exclusion to recognition of differences in historical experience. And there are also differences in ideas about the boundaries or uniformity of race. In Latin America, mixing is the norm, and purity is rarely assumed. Racism can find habitable quarters within multiple ideas about race. But the different meanings of race produce a difference in political problematics. When mestizaje is the norm, plurality is not taken as a prima facie problem, nor is historical transformation inevitably viewed as loss. OK, in this final section, then, I want to explain the idea that race is a historical formation with some more contextual detail by comparing and contrasting it to other related accounts. I'm going to flesh out the explanatory value of this approach with an example involving the formation of whiteness. The idea of race as a social construction is large and vague, encompassing semantic causal accounts, top-down or institutional causal accounts, as well as cultural accounts and historical accounts. So on the face of it, the idea of race as a historical formation, which I'm arguing for, is simply a form of the idea that race is a social construction. The historical formation theory is then simply saying that the social kind that race is has been formed by historical forces. But I want to make a distinction between two types of social constructivist claims. One type says that social events and policies have caused the ideas and ideologies of race to come into existence, while a second type says that historical events have brought into existence racialized identity formations in terms of ways of being, habits of action, and forms of life. On the first view, to believe that I have a racial identity is to have a mistaken belief that I should be weaned from, and it is to see myself as a victim to some extent of coercion from elites. On the second view, to believe that I have a racial identity is an accurate view, a true belief. Moreover, if we understand the racial identities that we have as the product of historical events and forces, we have a hand in changing these identities, perhaps even eradicating them in the future. But for this to happen, we have to take action. The historical formation view of race is then a realist view, but one in which the nature of the real is understood to be perpetually unstable and changeable. Another way to put this is that race is a species of historical ontology and Ian Hacking and Foucault's sense. Chike Jeffers, who's a young philosopher that you guys all should read, he's really, uh, has some really smart work. He, he divides um, social constructionists in a different way than I just did, but I think his way gets at the issue of causal agency that I do want to foreground. Uh, Jeffers divides them into those who have a theory of political constructionism and those who have a theory of cultural constructionism. Um, 
He takes Haslinger to exemplify the political constructionist view that races are the product of political policies and practices that have created social hierarchies and exclusions based on the idea of race. Although the result is that race has a social reality and thus it refers on his view, on her view, sorry, she takes the basic concept of race to be fallacious, similar to apia. The solution to racist hierarchy is then to diminish the usage of the concept of race. As Jeffers puts it, the political constructionist view is that, quote, race is made wholly or most importantly real by hierarchical relations of power, unquote. What is key here, I think, is, is the phrase he uses, wholly or most importantly. What this makes apparent is that various views of racial formation overlap with social constructionists and eliminativists, thus making these categories commensurable. The critical difference is where one places the causal and explanatory emphasis, hierarchical relations of power, or culture, or as I argue, history. One of the principal differences of emphasis within varied social constructionist accounts is whether or not a shared experience is given a causal role or is seen as merely a contingent effect. There's also a difference on how robust that shared experience is understood. Shelby cashes out shared experience in a, in a very minimalist way as shared oppression while Jeffers holds that there is a shared experience of cultural creation. Shelby's account, I think, is overly minimalist. It helpfully directs us away from assuming political or cultural uniformity within racialized groups, though, which is good. It's the sort of assumption that leads people to be surprised that all Latinx and black voters don't vote for the Democratic Party. It shouldn't be a surprise. But it declines on his view, I think, declines to even attempt to explain the divergent perceptual, dogmatic, relational, and cultural practices and formations that are group-related. So I'm, I'm more in agreement with Jeffers in these debates, and I want to encourage more attention to broad historical events, not just those that corral people and exert external coercions in various ways, but those that involve significant collective agency and praxis of non-elites. By considering the racial category of whiteness, I think we'll be able to see the importance and fruitfulness of the theory of race as a historical formation. So I'll say much more about the formation of whiteness on Friday, but let me um, develop this last example. White racial identity is best understood as local rather than a global phenomena, and that's true, of course, of every other racial identity. Not only are the criteria and boundaries of whiteness indexed to location as well as time period, but the difference between European formations of white identity and those in the Americas and Australia are quite distinct given the effects of settler colonialism and different national histories. In this slide, it's important to note that the history of the formation of whiteness as a category originates, as a number of historians and theorists now argue, in a relationship between Europe and its colonies in the Americas, particularly in the 17th and 18th centuries. Whiteness emerged in a way that eventually linked populations across the Atlantic, even though the distinct practices and experiences on other, either side um, created distinguishable forms and perhaps even degrees of whiteness. England's early colonization of North America relied heavily on a system of indentured servitude. Most um, of the indentured servants came from Europe, of course, and um, because this was a helpfully constrained labor force. The plantation economy in the state of Virginia, for example, was initially organized with the use of labor by indentured servants before the system of slavery was put into place. Indentured servants were housed separately, underfed, poorly clothed, ruled by overseers, and whipped, creating a structural and material organization of labor that was helpfully already in place when slavery emerged. The historian Nell Painter has no trouble calling such endangered servants slaves, given their limited freedom and poor treatment. But this system should remain distinguished from the system of chattel slavery that developed later 
which was imposed over the entirety of one's lifetime, was hereditary, and was organized by race. But it's important to understand this historical moment prior to chattel slavery. Indentured servants, largely from Europe, could not move about freely, nor were they allowed to leave their employers, no matter the beatings and abuse they suffered. They could also be sold. Although the law allowed that the indentured could eventually become free, many did not survive long enough to achieve their freedom. As slavery emerged prior to the inherited forms, servants and slaves sometimes made common cause, organizing collective escapes and rebellions, stealing food, or simply enjoying some alcohol-infused revelry together. The European poor, especially the ethnic poor, had long been subject to a form of essentialized representations that imputed their biological features as signs of their animal-like nature and inferiority. Their poverty, ignorance, and destitution were blamed on inherited characteristics. In this way, the abject conditions of their short laboring lives could be portrayed as inevitable and justified. Yet political problems ensued from this ill treatment and segregation. For one thing, the European poor had a tendency toward unruliness and rebellion. As historians Peter Leinbaugh and Marcus Rediger recount, they were vilified in England as motley urban mobs and rural barbarians of the commons. And they fomented some rebellious attacks on the gentry. Interestingly, in the growing transatlantic shipping fleets as well as in the American colonies, these unruly mobs sometimes became multiracial, throwing the Irish together with Africans as well as others. The breadth of this collaborative resistance posed an obvious threat to the stability of elite control. When the system of slave labor began to expand in the plantation-based colonies, the English parliament had a debate over whether it was a good idea to subject the Irish to chattel forms of slavery in which there would be no possibility, however remote, of buying their freedom. The English elite decided against enslaving the Irish, <laughs> choosing instead to draw a sharp line between what might be done to the Irish and what might be done to other groups on the grounds of a worrisome domino effect of brutalization. The Irish, after all, looked a bit like them. The move to make slavery based on race inescapable and isolated to Africans occurred over a process of decades and even centuries, and it varied by regions and states. But by the early part of the 19th century, the system of racially based chattel slavery was instituted nationally rendering the children of slaves the property of their owners, owners that were mostly white, though there were a few slave owners who were African Americans and Native Americans. The new system recognized status variations among non-whites, based largely on property and citizenship as well as gender. But all whites were protected from slavery. Blacks could own slaves, but whites could not be enslaved. Eventually, more laws were passed making it illegal for blacks to employ whites or purchase firearms. And there was an extension of the way in which landless whites could gain land through expropriation of native territory or of the small plots that previously could be owned by slaves. This period of transformation instigated the development of what some have named a Heronvoke democracy um, and others call a Heronvoke republicanism. Um, Rodiger prefers the term Heronvoke Republicanism because of the income inequality among whites, uh, whereas Christina Beltran and Joel Olson argue that democracy never promises income equality anyway. As Joel Olson puts it, a Heronvoke democracy is a polity ruled in the interests of a white citizenry and characterized by simultaneous relations of equality and privilege, equality among whites who are privileged in relation to those who are not white. The equality among whites was thin, yet terribly significant. No whites could be enslaved. 
which gave the unruly a reason for developing patriotism in regard to these new settler states, as well as making alliances with white elites who had ensured their protection from slavery. The racialized divisions that had existed in Europe within whiteness such as Northern European and Southern European, etc., had given way then to a uniform identity of whiteness. White privilege then lay in a certain protected property and political rights, but also, as importantly, in the capacity to engage in extra-legal acts of violence, including murder, rape, and the theft of land and property. The now all-white unruly mobs turned their energies and know-how onto the native groups inhabiting arable lands beyond the newly established United States along the eastern seaboard. Life in the colonies was inadequate for the growing population of European immigrants, stimulating what historian Daniel Emmerwar calls white land hunger. Many of the elites ruling the new nation were satisfied with the area east of the Mississippi River and they thought the rest of the continent was fine to just leave to the natives. 46% of what is now the United States was officially designated by these elites Indian country or Indian territory with the idea that Indians then living in the east, such as the large Cherokee nation, would be forced west into this other territory. And there was an, an initiative to recognize delegates from this Indian territory with a seat in the US Congress. Elites thought this plan to push native groups out of the East would solve the problem of white land hunger, but it did not. Whites began to break treaties, overturn borders, burn villages, and seize native land illegally within the so-called Indian territory. Even Supreme Court rulings that tried to protect the Cherokee were ineffective in the face of what Emmerwar calls this squatter onslaught. As a result, elites gave in, realizing that the only way to control the situation and maintain their power was to give these landless whites what they wanted. The white mobs began to riot with impunity in all non-white areas, destroying black or Mexican-owned businesses and neighborhoods and seizing farms, wiping out their economic rivals and forcing almost all non-whites into low-paid wage work and domestic service. For most of this period, throughout the 19th and early 20th century, whites had the exclusive or almost exclusive right to homestead, attain skilled jobs, legally immigrate, and participate in political institutions. <coughs> Non-whites could sometimes legally participate in these practices, but then they were vulnerable to racist mob violence, the theft of their land and businesses, and forcible displacement after which no one was, pu was punished. Elites had solved their problem, divided the motley mobs into two broad categories, white and non-white, and secured loyalty from the largest sector of the working class, which was white. This sordid history should remind us of the present day in which whites secured their own borders by murdering an African-American man in Georgia, Armad Arbery, for jogging in a white neighborhood. Um, just one of you know, many of the murders I'm sure you've heard about over the last few years. Uh, they, the people who murdered Arbery assumed that they could commit this act without punishment. White on non-white violence motivated, um, whether enacted by civilians or authorities of the criminal justice system, um, is it's still assumed to be legitimate actions that will not result in punishment. So I, I want to emphasize, however, that such practices are not the only ingredient in the white, um, for the formation, the historical formation of white racial identity. In settler colonial societies, white immigration was a drive to escape extreme poverty, imprisonment, and persecution, which would be their lot if they stayed in Europe. Neither survival nor prosperity in the Americas and Australia was guaranteed. Most of those who came as the landless poor remained so, or with modest incomes. The United States has the second highest poverty rate of all OECD countries. The rate of white poverty and near poverty is lowest, 
um, of all the racial groups, but in real numbers, there have always been more white poor than any other group. Persons and families who are poor experience food insecurity, cannot afford a two-bedroom apartment in any state in the United States, have inadequate health care and education, cannot send their kids to college. For most of the white poor, this is simply a continuation of what their families have experienced since migration. So the experiential content of white racial identity has included a family history of migration, generally in the form of an escape, often involving much hardship, as well as a protected political standing that operated, to quote Joel Olson, as a form of social power. The historic ship lives on as a form of family lore, while the social power to exclude and mistreat non-whites continues with a legal system that either enacts mistreatment in its carceral and police systems or excuses white-on-non-white -white violence in the private sphere. As Beltran puts it, the most recent violence against Central American refugees mobilizes the tradition of this social power in new ways in which the movement of certain subjects, that is, white European immigrants, is understood to be the manifestation of liberty, while the movement of others is deemed unruly, excessive, and dangerous. Um, and as Falguni Sheth argues, whiteness is a dynamic historical formation that emerged to redefine unruliness as a characteristic only of the non-white other. Whites who engage in informal or formal violence against non-whites do not, in general, experience themselves as engaging in immoral, unlawful, or unruly behavior. This is the central point I want to make, the effects on the formation of subjectivity. To quote Beltran again, she says, quote, acts of dispossession, slavery, and white supremacy shaped settler relationships to land and labor, as well as creating particular forms of collective identity and shared governance, unquote. This is the historical genealogy of whiteness in the United States. But to say this is not to reify or congeal the meanings and experiences of whiteness or render it fixed or politically stable. Whiteness today is in ferment, <laughs> as we see large sectors of the white citizenry willing to face police violence to oppose racist states, to participate in Black Lives Matter's protests, to get arrested, and to protect the rights of refugees to migrate. But what we need to understand is that white racial identity, like other racial identities, is not simply the product of policy, but of practices, actions, relationships, and experiences that have shaped subjectivity, perception, and judgment across generations in ways that one can discern across the spectrum of white nationalist violence all the way to white liberal paternalism. What unifies this spectrum is assumptions of superiority, entitlement to political power, land, and resources fueling gentrification, skewed definitions of crime, and a collection of interpersonal modes of behavior organized around race. What will change whiteness will not just be policy change or the elimination of categories, but historical experiences. The generation or more after the set-asides for whites have themselves been set aside, there will be changes in experience, reaction, and reformation of relationships to experience a living alongside rather than over. Whiteness, however, will retain its functional semantic utility and political importance to signify and remember a different racial history. Thank you very much. Please send your questions to me on email. I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Thank you very much, Linda, for this extremely rich and thoughtful talk. Um, I'm deeply unhappy with cutting this event short at this point, but things are as they are, at least for the time being. So 
Linda already told you, you might may send her an email or to me if you have any questions about this talk. And we will be happy seeing you again tomorrow. You're invited to the second talk tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you.